worship in your sight at this time. In Jesus' precious name, amen. It's good to have you all here with us this day. This is Halloween week. It's not something we worship, uh, though it began with a good idea. It's become something that's demonic and all that. But, you know, we can turn that into something positive. And that is when they come to our house asking for candy, we can actually share the gospel with them. We have tracks up here that you can take, no charge. And when they come around, just drop a track that explains the gospel of Jesus Christ to them when they come by. They're yours for the taking. Feel free. We're in the midst of a series at the moment dealing with the commandments of Jesus. The commandments of Jesus are those things which he specifically gave to us. It's our responsibility, our duty to do them. The one that we're going to look at today is the command, Seek my kingdom. It comes from Matthew 6.33. Uh, Matthew 6.33, a verse that many of us know. But let's read it together in, in respect for God's word. Let's stand one more time. Together, Matthew 6.33. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. The Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. You may be seated. Seeking God in his kingdom deals with priorities. What are the priorities of your house? I was reading a man by the name of Wendell Winkler. And he, he had this to say, he says, What priorities will be established in our children when the following things happen? We are early for the game, but consistently late to worship. We see to it that our children do their homework, but never to check to see if they do their Bible reading. Our children are allowed, not allowed to stay up late during the week because it will interfere with their schoolwork, but they can stay up as long as they want on Saturday night, regardless of the fact that they're going to church the next day. We will not let them miss school even though they do not want to attend. But we cater to their whims when they decide not to want to go to church. We know the names of their school teachers but cannot tell the names of their Sunday school teachers. We serve as mother, room mother, or president of the PTA at school, but what about helping at a function at the church? We attend their open house at school, but not their open house at VBS. We will not schedule vacations so that they would have to miss school. But what about scheduling vacations during vacation Bible school and other major church events? They see us go to work even though we don't feel well but stay at home from church when the same symptoms occur. They see us look at and study their schoolwork, but never pay attention to their handiwork they bring home from Sunday school. Winkler says, Yes, with such situations prevailing, what priorities are being established in the hearts of the children? What are your priorities? Priorities reflect character. Your character is expressed in what you think is important and in what you do. The aim of Jesus in Matthew 6, which is part of the Sermon on the Mount, which we went through last year, is to make sure that they understand what the priorities are. In the passage of Matthew 6.33, just before this and just after, uh, Jesus is trying to alleviate the anxieties of life. People are anxious about food and clothing and stature of life and all these different things. And Jesus says in the midst of it all, Seek first my kingdom, my righteousness, and all these other things. That's gravy on the toast. Oh, he didn't say that, did he? But that's what he meant, wasn't it? 
All these things shall be added to you. When your priorities are on Jesus and his kingdom, then God will take care of all the other details. When we look at the commandments of the Lord, the commandments are given for our benefit. They're to help us to establish what is right, good, and lovely in our lives. And these commandments are, are not arbitrary. They're requirements. It's what we are obligated to do. He demands this of us. He expects us to obey Him. That's why they're called commands. We look at this command that's before us today, to seek first. It involves the pursuit of priorities. Uh, we, we have to look at what does it mean first to seek first his kingdom. Uh, the word seek deals to actively pursue, to look for, to, to try and obtain. It's interesting in the Greek, this is a present imperative. The present is something you do, not just one time, but continually. It's not you seek God one time in your life, you have an experience with God, yeah, I know God now, and then you forget Him. It's a continual seeking, day by day and moment by moment. We seek Him out. Every aspect of our life is seen in Him. The, the Greek word here is actually a word that you know, but not in the same context. The, the word first is the word proton. Now, all the chemists among us know it, that's a positively charged particle in the molecule. But in Greek, it means number one. And what Jesus wants us to do is to make Him, His kingdom, His righteousness, number one in our life. The priority of our life, the first thing that we think of in the morning, the last thing that we think of at night, is Jesus. That's a priority He wants us. How do we do that? Well, what we have to do is seek the King in our own heart. The first aspect of seeking the kingdom is to seek the King of the kingdom. Uh, it's, you got to know the king. Now, if you don't have a personal relationship with, with Jesus, how can you seek him? And, and so if you're here today and, and you've never had a relationship with Jesus, what you need to do is confess your sin. And, and you need to place faith in Jesus. And, and by doing that, he comes into your life. But it doesn't stop that. That's just the start of the relationship. And, and, and we begin to pursue him. And, and he promises that if you seek me, you'll find me. That's his promise to each of us. God is not hard to find. God is there to be found. He wants to be found. The problem we have is we don't seek him. We don't look for him in circumstances and situations. Jesus will show himself. He wants us to think about him. He wants our thoughts throughout the day to be focused on him. He wants us to know him. And he offers the invitation to us all. He wants the first part of our day. He wants our first thought in the morning. He wants the first part of our paycheck. He wants the first part of everything because he is number one in our life. That's what it means. It's vain to say you're seeking the kingdom when you don't know the king. Seek him. But additionally, it means seeking the kingdom in our own heart. The kingdom needs to be an obsession. Are you obsessed with the kingdom of God in your own life? I know a man who it was, his obsession. His name was David. David expressed this in Psalm 27. He says, one thing have I desired of the Lord. One thing will I seek after, that I may dwell in the presence of the Lord 
to inquire in his temple. That was his obsession, to be with God. And, and, and to have him be the number one thing in our life. Is Jesus your obsession? Are you obsessed with him? I mean, you, you want to be with him and, and you can't think of doing anything w without him. That's what he wants. That's what he demands. That's what he commands. We struggle with that. Because not only should we be obsessed with it, we should be seeking to let the king rule where we're at. The kingdom is a place where the king rules. It's an oxymoron to have a kingdom, but the king isn't in control. I think too much of our life, we want to be part of God's kingdom, but not the way that he wants to do it. We object to it. The king wants to own every part of you and be in control of every part of you. Have, have any of you read Charles Hummel's book, My Heart, Christ Home? Anybody read that? A few of you? If you haven't got this booklet, sell your car and buy the book. It's that good. It only cost about 75 cents, okay? So if you have a junker, you can still buy it, all right? Hummel describes how that our heart is like a house. And Jesus comes into our house, and he wants to go into every room and clean it up. And if we know Jesus is coming, you know what we tend to do? We take all our dirt and trash and dirty laundry, and we stuff them into this side room that nobody goes into. And Jesus comes into the house and, hey, Jesus, look, we've cleaned up the living room. Woo! And Jesus passes that door and he says, I want to go in there. And you go, no. Jesus, you can't go in there. That stinks in there. And Jesus says, no, I want to go in there. If he's the king, he gets the rule over everything. Not just the rooms that you choose to open to him. Read Hummel's booklet. It's really an inspiring thing that we ought to all read. It challenges our life that every aspect of our life should be submitted to the king. A third thing. The kingdom is a place where the king is honored. Our lives should honor Jesus. You know, I think the Apostle Paul said it very well in 1 Corinthians 10.31 when he says, Whatever you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it to the glory of God. So when I'm eating that bowl of ice cream, I glorify God. Oh man, that's glory. And when I do the dishes, I do it to the glory of God. And when I take out the trash, I take out the trash to the glory of God. And when I work, I work for the glory of God. And, and when, when I come to the church and I sing, I sing to the glory of God. Everything that I do should honor Him Every word that I speak, every thought that I think, everything should be lifted up, and he is glorified by it. That's how you honor the king, because we're seeking him first and trying to honor him the most. Additionally, the kingdom of God looks to the king for guidance. Do you know where you find guidance from the king? I'll give you a hint. You know what this is? This is guidance for life and practice. Just look to him. It doesn't give you every answer to every circumstance and situation in life, but it sure gives principles that impact every circumstance and situation. Isn't that what he says in, in, in Proverbs 3, 5, and 6? Trust in the Lord with all your heart. 
Lean not into your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him. And what will he do? Direct your path. He'll give you guidance. So if we're seeking the kingdom, we're seeking to do what God would have us to do in the way that God would have us to do it in the time that he would have us to do it. Uh, that's what seeking the kingdom of God is about. But understand and remember, there's one thing about the kingdom. The kingdom is yet to come. When the king was here on earth, he said the kingdom of God is among you. But there's going to come a day, not only when the kingdom is among us, it's going to be over us. There's going to be a day when the king actually rules on earth. I was reading in my devotions in 2 Peter 3 this morning, and it talks about that very thing. It says how, what godly lives we ought to be living in light of the fact that he's coming again to establish his kingdom. And so it's yet to come, and therefore we have an anticipation for when the day that Jesus himself will reign on earth, and the evil that we see today will be dispensed with, and there will be a holy and just God in charge of all things. The kingdom is not now. But we can live for the kingdom and the king now. And look with anticipation for the day when the king will be here. There's a twofold command in this verse. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. The pursuit of righteousness. You, you see, that's an equal participation. Because it's not just seeking the king. That's conduct. It's seeking his righteousness. That's character. That's the righteousness within us. And each of us needs to learn not just to seek God and say, Oh, I love you, Jesus. By the way, I do that driving down the road or walking the dog. or Sometimes I'll just blurt out, I love you, Lord. And then I look around to see if anybody saw me do that. I'm wondering who I was talking to. But I, I do. I mean, it just pops out. I know I'm crazy. <laughs> but, but the issue is this. Our character is reflected in what we do. And we need to develop the character, not just seeking God's control, but the changing within so that we love to do the things that God says to us to do. A man's character is reflected in his actions. In 1 John 3, verses 2 and 3, it says, Beloved, now we are the children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And everyone that has this hope in him purifies himself, even as he is pure. Character is seen in our conduct. Righteousness is doing that which is right. And, and so when we pursue his righteousness, we're pursuing doing things the right things, with the right attitudes. And we know that we are expressing his righteousness. When? When certain things occur. Understand this. We must desire his righteousness. We have to desire it. Jesus, a little bit earlier in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, in the Beatitudes says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Are we starving for righteousness? Do we have a thirst for righteousness as though we're stuck out in the middle of the desert with no water? That is what we need to have, a passion to follow God in righteousness. That's seeking his righteousness. To desire it more than food or water. 
We also must seek it. We're to seek righteousness. Because it doesn't come from us, it comes from Him. The Apostle Paul in Philippians 3.9 says, That I may be found in Him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. We have to seek the righteousness. It comes from that relationship. We not only must desire it, we must seek it, but we also have to live it. I, I like what Will Rogers said. Some of you may not know who he is, but he was, uh, I think he died in the 40s, uh, 1940s, 1950s, somewhere in that. He was a, 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 we would call him a country western comedian and a humorist. Will Rogers said, we ought to live in such a way that we would not be ashamed to sell the family parrot to the town gossip. That's living it. In every aspect of life, whether in private or in public, we live out the righteousness of God. We seek his kingdom. We seek his righteousness. You know what God does in return? He promises us something. He promises that all these things will be added unto us. You know, you, you look in Matthew 6 where he's talking, verse 19. He, he says that people worry about money, finances. In verse 25, people are worried about food. In verse 27, it's talking about physical stature. You, you tall or short or got hair or no hair, you know, all those things. In verse 28, he, he talks about people who are worried about the clothes they wear. And, and Jesus says, don't concern yourselves with those things. Don't be anxious about them. If you seek my kingdom and you seek my righteousness, I promise you that I'll meet every need that you have. Whoo! God's going to meet every need that we have if we pursue. But understand this, there's some lessons we need to learn about needs. Here's four things. First, understand this. We don't need everything we want. Now, now, my little granddaughter, who's almost four now, she reaches the point where we sit down and we watch cartoons together. Very intellectually stimulating. But then they have commercials. And you know what she says? I want that. I want that. I want that. She doesn't need that. Are we any different? I want that. I want that. I want that. Just because you want it doesn't mean you need it. Second thing. We don't want everything we need. When I was growing up, I got spankings. I know you think I was a perfect child, but my mom will tell you otherwise. I deserved every spanking I got and probably a bunch more too. I did not want to be spanked. But did I need it? Yes, because by the spankings I learned discipline and right from wrong. I didn't want them, but I needed them. Third thing. God does not give us everything we want. Just because you want it, God is not obligated to give it to you. I don't know, many of you probably have heard the prayer of an unknown Confederate soldier. Sometimes it's called the creed for the disabled. This is what it says. I ask God for strength that I might achieve. I was made weak that I might learn humbly to obey. I ask for health that I might do greater things. I was given infirmity that I might do better things. 
I asked for riches that I might be happy. I was given poverty that I might be wise. I asked for power that I might have the praise of men. I was given weakness that I might feel the need for God. I asked for all things that I might enjoy life. I was given life that I might enjoy all things. I got nothing that I asked for, but everything I hoped for. Almost despite myself, my unspoken prayers were answered. I am among all men most richly blessed. God doesn't give us everything that we want. But he does promise this. That he will give us everything that we need. That's an absolute promise of God. Everything that we need. I heard the story of the two store owners, and uh, one guy put out in his hardware store, if you need it, we have it. Now, his competitor across the street saw the sign, and he put up a, a, his own advertisement. And it said, if we don't have it, you don't need it. There's a principle we can learn from this. If you don't have it, you don't need it. I don't like that. If you don't have it, you know what it means? God says you don't need it right now. Because God's a faithful God. And because he's a faithful God, and he says, I'll meet your every need. I have to conclude what? I ain't got it. I ain't got a need. You say, but God, I really, really need it. And God says, I'll meet all your needs. My way, my time. Not your way, not your time. And can we have the faith and trust in God that he will do it his way? We look at the command. Seek God, his righteousness, his kingdom. And God promises to meet all our need. How, how does that impact my life? How's my life going to be different? How do I apply this? You know, I think what we all need to do is become a kingdom man. That's what Tony Evans calls it. And we have Bible studies that have been going on, book studies in, in this church for men talking about becoming a kingdom man. That's living in light of a kingdom, being a father, a husband, a man who represents the kingdom of God. It's, it's something that if you haven't gone through, it's something that would be valuable for every single man in this congregation to go through. We even do it in an elective class on Sunday mornings, and the women are invited. And the women sit there and go, go men, go men, go men. Quieter, ladies. No, louder. Go men, go men. Do it. We need to become a kingdom person. Living in light of the kingdom. What, what does that look like? Let me give you an illustration. Illustration of what I tr think is truly a kingdom sort of man. His name was Polycarp. He lived in the first and second century. He was a, a disciple of, of John, the apostle. Uh, he was born somewhere around... Uh, 80, 70, 80, 69, lived to be 86 years old. In the middle of the second century, Christianity fell into persecution. And it, it became so bad that they began to scream for the blood of Christians to be thrown into the Colosseum with the, the lions and the beasts. And, and they screamed for the leadership to be cast in. And so the Roman Empire called for the head of Polycarp because he was the bishop at Smyrna. Smyrna is in modern-day Turkey, 
we call it Asia Minor in the Bible. And so the Roman soldiers went out to find Polycarp. The church tried to hide him. You know, a dear saint at 86. But the Roman soldiers found two young Christians and tortured them until Polycarp's location was disclosed. The church found out about it and tried to move him away, but Polycarp says no, no. The soldiers showed up at Polycarp's location. He opened the door, went out, and greeted them as they were friends, invited them in for a meal. And this took them back, and he fed them. And they told him, well, we have to take you and imprison you. He says, the only thing I ask is you give me one hour to pray. And he fell on his knees and began to pray. And they listened to him pray. And they felt so ashamed. They gave him two hours. And, and, and they didn't want to even take him then after hearing him pray. What, what has this man done? So they brought him before the pro council who after hearing all that had gone on in the warmth that Polycarp greeted him, tried to free him. But there was no way. The proconsul turned to him and said, Polycarp, curse God and I'll let you go. And Polycarp's reply was, 86 years I have served him. He has never done me wrong. How can I blaspheme my king who saved me? The proconsul looked again and said, Just do this, old man. Just swear by the spirit of the emperor, and that'll be sufficient. And Polycarp's reply was, If you imagine for a moment that I would do that, then I think you pretend that you don't know who I am. Hear it plainly. I am a Christian. Proconsul made more in treaties, but Polycarp stood firm. The proconsul threatened him, being thrown to the beast, and Polycarp said, bring them forth. I would change my mind if it meant going from worst to best, but not to change from right to wrong. The proconsul threatened, I will burn you alive. And Polycarp's was, reply was, you threaten with fire that burns for an hour and is over. But the judgment on the ungodly is forever. They threw him in the fire. And in the agony of the situation, they still saw a godly man. They couldn't stand it. So they finished him off with a dagger so that he wouldn't suffer. That's a kingdom man. One who lives for Jesus and who cannot be swayed by the world. Are you a kingdom man? A kingdom person? Is Jesus the priority of your life? Is living his righteousness the priority of your life? Do you trust him to meet your every need? Do you have that faith? Where is Jesus in your life? His command, seek first the kingdom of his God and his righteousness. And everything else? Icing on the cake. Join me. In